quite sure whether we all agree about the changes uh, to public opinion making these days, but that is Jana's job later on to find out whether her panel agrees or disagrees and whether we can form our opinion. We'll have uh, the foreign minister here in this round from 11 o'clock onwards. And ladies and gentlemen, in order to get kicked off, we're going to have a focus uh, on one of the guys behind probably one of the hottest stories last year. In uh, May, June, you will remember The Guardian published a couple of uh, newspaper reports with somebody who nobody knew at the time, but who became a household name, Edward Snowden. And uh, the guy behind that and the person who actually sat with Snowden for a couple of days in a stinking hot hotel in Hong Kong uh, was Glenn Greenwald. Of course, Glenn Greenwald's life has changed ever since. Uh, he's no longer with The Guardian. Uh, he is a public opinion maker these days, um, as he was before on other issues. But of course, now he is uh, talking about issues that you and your panel will be discussing. And he's actually uh, sent a message. He would have been here if he could have been. Uh, but this is Glenn Greenwell's views that he would like to share with all of us. Hello, everyone, and thank you so much to the Joyce Bell Global Media Forum for inviting me to record an address. I was hoping to be able to appear there in person, but unfortunately, my scheduling did not permit that. I know it's a great conference, and, and I hope to be able to attend in person, um, hopefully next year. When I was back in Hong Kong and began working on the documents that our source, Edward Snowden, provided to us, we spent a great deal of time in Hong Kong, obviously talking about the debate that was likely to ensue about surveillance and privacy. But back in Hong Kong, we spent at least as much time talking about the debate that likely would be triggered relating to journalism. And that was because I knew that these documents, these revelations, would have as much of an impact on how people thought about journalism as they did on any other topic. And I think the last year has really proven that to be true, as there has been a greater focus on the threat posed by surveillance to individual privacy, which is an obvious linkage. There has been a debate focused on the threat posed to democracy by allowing states to construct a, a secret surveillance system, and I think that's fairly obvious, too. How can we be said to have a healthy, functioning democracy if the most consequential acts of our government are being done without the knowledge of our citizenry, not just the not, not only the details of, of what they're doing, but even the broad contours. This is an incredibly profoundly consequential system of surveillance that has been constructed without any knowledge on the part of citizen the citizenries of, of what we call democracies. And I think there's been a lot of focus on that as well. But there also has been a, a really important debate that has arisen over journalism as a result of the revelations. And and I think that's true in, in two different ways. The first is there, there has really been a, a debate that has been triggered about the proper role of journalists vis-a-vis -vis the state and, and those who wield the greatest amount of power. And that was a debate that we were hoping to trigger and I think has been triggered as a result of these revelations. Ever since the September 11th attack in the United States, I would say before that as well, but it's certainly been intensified and accelerated, there has been an extraordinarily close relationship between American media outlets and the U.S. government. And I think this framework has been replicated throughout the West. The run-up to the Iraq war is the most notorious example where the United States government was able to convince huge numbers of Americans and Westerners throughout the world of patently false claims involving Saddam Hussein and, and Iraq, not only because the U.S. government was willing to disseminate falsehoods, but because uh, leading American newspaper outlets led by the New York Times endorsed those falsehoods, mindlessly published them on their front pages without much skepticism or investigation. And I think this was the result of this very disturbing tendency where media outlets have become increasingly accommodating of and deferential to those who wield great political power. And one of the things we hope to achieve with the reporting that we've done is to reanimate the idea that the proper relationship between journalists and those who wield power is adversarial in nature, one that works not toward the same ends with the same perspectives, but toward different ends with different perspectives, and that namely the role of journalists, above all else, is to provide investigative checks and genuine limits on the way in which people who exercise power can wield that power. And I think the debate that has arisen as a result of these revelations has been very healthy in that regard over what journalists should be doing when they come into possession of, of secrets showing that government leaders are doing all sorts of consequential things that the public is unaware of. But there's a second aspect to the debate uh, 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 about journalism that has been triggered by these surveillance revelations that I think it are, is just as important, which is that 
As I said, there's been lots of talk about the threat posed to privacy and the threat posed to democracy by state surveillance. When a government is collecting massive amounts of metadata, billions of telephone and email events every single day, and therefore knows everybody who is communicating with everyone else, it becomes very difficult, if not impossible, for sources to come forward to journalists with the confidence and security that they can do so in secret, that they can do so without being detected. And this has posed a very genuine threat to a free press. And I hope, I think there are a lot of different impacts and, and reforms that will come from the revelations over the last year, but I think one of the most important is that we now understand, as journalists and any other profession that needs confidentiality, whether it be doctors or psychiatrists or human rights workers or lawyers, and certainly journalists, of the need to use technologies to protect the confidentiality of our communications, especially with sources, which means having media organizations have people in-house who can train journalists and editors and others on the very potent tools of encryption and other means of keeping what we do on the internet secure. And that can really revitalize the process of journalism and the news gathering process in a climate where pervasive state surveillance seems to be something that will be with us for quite a long time. So those are just a couple of the, the really significant debates over journalism um, that I think have, have been triggered by the revelations of the last year. And, and I think it has a profound effect around the world about how journalism is, is viewed and understood, not by just we as journalists, but by the public more generally. So thank you very much for, for the opportunity to talk briefly, um, though I hope informatively, about a couple of these issues. Wow. When somebody uh, in, in radio spoke that fast, we used to sort of, you know, slow him down a little bit. You can't do that uh, in television, uh, but uh, certainly a high speed set there. I hope that you're going to take away both the heat and the speed. Uh, Jana Paraiges uh, is anchor at DWTV uh, for the journal. You have a fascinating uh, panel, so please keep up the uh, energy. So welcome to the panel Global and Participatory Political Opinion Making in the Digital Age. I'm very happy that you're all here. My name is Jana Paraiges. I will be moderating the discussion and I'm very happy to introduce our great panelists. Professor Guy Berger, he has worked as a journalist himself for years, so he knows how important freedom of expression is. He is now the Director of Freedom of Expression Online and Media Development at UNESCO. Welcome, Professor Guy Berger. <laughs> Amy Goodman wants democracy now. That's the name of a news program she's hosting in the US. She is an investigative journalist and is the first journalist who has won the Right Livelihood Award, the Alternative Nobel Prize. Amy, we're very happy you're here. <laughs> Matthew Armstrong is a member of the Broadcasting Board of Governors in the U.S. The BBG oversees all U.S. civilian international media. And he says, well, new media is important, but traditional media shouldn't be underestimated. He will tell us why during the discussion. I'm glad you made it. <laughs> Emma Ruby Sachs is the campaign director for Avas. Avas is a huge online platform and global civic organization with more than 36 million members. She is a good example for the fact that you, you can find things on the internet that are inspiring because she was online Googling things and then she found the topic on water privatization in South Africa. So she wrote her first novel about it. Amy, great you made it. <laughs> If you want to become the president of the most powerful country in the world, you have to talk to Julius van der Laar. He is an independent campaign and strategy consultant and worked on Barack Obama's presidential campaigns. Julius van der Laar, welcome to the panel. <laughs> So, of course, we don't just want to talk about new media, we want to use new media at this conference. So, we have two colleagues of mine, Chiponda Chimbelo and Michael Münz, who are watching Twitter. So, we need you to send us your questions and comments during this discussion so we can post them to the panelists. And the hashtag should be, yeah, you can see it on the wall, the hashtag is WS16. So Julius, I know you know political communication by heart. So tell us, what is your favorite political online campaign? There's so many. Uh, you have the <laughs> <laughs> Always helps. Uh, there you go. Um, so 
couple of great campaigns. Obviously, you mentioned the Obama campaign in uh, 2008, which was fantastic. Um, people reminisce about it, and uh, we all remember hope and change, and we get excited about it. At least I still do. Um, and, you know, for the first time, um, maybe with the exception of Howard Dean, um, campaigns started using the Internet as a tool of organization. So we talk about how media changes the way we participate uh, in communication and uh, Obviously, that uh, speaks to the theme of this conference. All of a sudden, people were able to engage in a campaign. I think that's something that we haven't seen in recent years, especially over here in Europe, how people took the streets and went knocking on doors and all that kind of stuff. So I feel like the Obama campaign harnessed uh, uh, the use of social media, the use of online in terms of organization. They did that particularly well. And obviously, other organizations like Avaz do very similar things and drive 36 million people to take online action. So I feel like people are getting a voice that haven't, been able to participate in politics the same way before. Let me right, go right back to Emma Ruby Sachs. Um, how do, does Avas mobilize people on social issues online? So a bit of, just the mic, shall yes. we? <laughs> <laughs> a bit of background about Avaz. Um, we're a global civic movement. We just crossed 37 million members yesterday, um, which is fabulous. And we give people around the world the chance to take action on issues they care about every week and take action collectively and globally sort of realizing that promise that we have a lot more that unites us than divides us around the world. Um, and we use the internet all the time. You know, it's an amazing tool to bring people and money and information and power together more efficiently than ever before. Our members can do everything from sign a petition to pick up the phone and call world leaders. And then that can lead to even more action offline. So actually getting into the streets. We're organizing a big march September 21st in New York about climate change and needing a global deal to really tackle that. Um, and then it also results in original litigation. Uh, it can have um, media effects. We do big advertising campaigns to publicize the call of our members. Uh, so the internet is a portal and it's a connector. And then the campaigns take off from there. Thanks. Professor Guy Berger, UNESCO is currently doing a study on privacy and um, freedom of expression online. Can you tell us more about that? Well, good morning, everybody. This uh, study that, you, as you mentioned, UNESCO is doing, it fits into this topic of political opinion making because it looks particularly at the question of journalists' freedom of expression and privacy. Now, I'd like to start by quoting somebody. I'm going to channel somebody, and I want the, the people here to guess who it is. Who said this? I'm very concerned that surveillance is becoming too aggressive National security and criminal activity may justify exceptional and narrowly tailored use of surveillance, but that is all the more reason to safeguard human rights and fundamental freedoms. We need to protect freedom or we, or we will undermine order. Okay, here's a clue. It was not Glenn Greenwald. <laughs> Who said that? No, it was Ban Ki-moon. So here you have the head of the UN who represents the entire international community making quite a strong statement on this question. So this is the context in which I think we're talking about political opinion making because it's, it's a big question, what is the role of the public and the role of the media in a context where there is aggressive surveillance? And I'd like to mention one more thing here also, that the UN General Assembly itself in December last year passed a resolution where they called on every government in the world to review its surveillance setup and set up independent and transparent mechanisms and independent oversight. So this then puts the kind of onus on people here and the media and everybody to say, well, what exactly is happening following this resolution? Is there the review taking place in every country? What are these independent mechanisms? And part of the study that we're doing, which you can find one word, internet study and uh, UNESCO, we try to get crowdsourced wisdom on this. In what ways can there be independent oversight? Should the media be part of independent oversight, for example? In what way can there be transparency? How do you balance these things? So please, um, I'm partially here to promote this study because UNESCO has 195 governments that will decide partially on the basis of public opinion and the results of this study so put your input into the study about what you think could be the best balance to support freedom of expression and politi political participation in the digital age. 
Monsieur Armstrong, I already mentioned uh, that the Broadcasting Board of Governors oversees U.S. civilian international media. Tell us more exactly what the BBC does. Sure. So thank you. Um, uh, thank you for uh, hosting us for the panel. Thank you, Ralph. Wonderful job. And, and Peter Ford, <laughs> who I don't see here. Uh, so, and congratulations to the Germans for last night, <laughs> although I think it was this morning. Um, so, um, yes, uh, the Broadcasting Board of Governors, which includes uh, 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 the Voice of America, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, Middle East Broadcast Networks, which most people know as Al Hura, um, Office Cuba Broadcasting, Radio Free Asia. Um, the fundamental purpose, the remit of this organization is the freedom of news and information. Uh, what is generally too little known about us is the anti-censorship information freedom that we spend tens of millions of dollars on, which puts us in direct partnership with, uh, with uh, my colleagues. Also little known is that the same people that wrote the UNESCO Charter were behind our original purpose. So the battle uh, wars begin in the minds of men and the UNESCO uh, preamble was written by the same people that uh, uh, established Voice of America as a civilian entity in, in uh, 1945 and the same people the State Department were deeply involved. So the mission of our agency is to promote uh, uh, local and free media, provide news and information, the ability for people to understand what's going on in the world, to understand what accountability, what elections look like, and what they, what rule of law is and how they should empower it. So uh, look forward to the conversation, but we're about empowering people through the freedom of uh, 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 to access and uh, share news and information. Amy Goodman, you try to give people a voice who are otherwise not heard. Is new media giving the voiceless a voice? Well, let me just say first that Democracy Now! Um, uh, just turned 18. We've been broadcasting for 18 years, and we started on eight community radio stations in 1996, and we're now broadcasting on over 1,200 public radio and television stations around the United States and around the world. And our motto is to go to where the silence is, uh, to be there to cover the stories of those who can't tell their own stories and tell those stories until they can tell their own, or simply to hand over the microphone for people who are not usually heard to be heard, to discuss the critical issues of the day. And I'm not talking about a fringe minority or even a silent majority, but the silenced majority, silenced by the corporate media. Um, we are here today in a very crucial time. In Egypt right now, three Al Jazeera journalists have been sentenced to seven to ten years in prison. They've already been in prison for months now. Um, in the United States, we have gone through situations over the last few years where the administration, the Obama administration, has tapped the phones of the Associated Press of 100 reporters and editors to the shock of so many. Um, also, whistleblowers have been gone after with more intensity. More whistleblowers have been prosecuted than in all presidencies combined of the past. We're at a time when Edward Snowden, who has launched this global conversation around privacy and surveillance, has sought political asylum in Russia because he's concerned about coming back to the United States and being tried for treason. When the publisher, Julian Assange, is holed up in the Ecuadorian embassy in London because he's concerned if he steps outside, he'll be extradited to Sweden and then afraid he'll be extradited to the United States and prosecuted for WikiLeaks. I'm looking forward to hearing Sarah Harrison tomorrow here giving the keynote who helped facilitate Edward Snowden leaving Hong Kong and making his way uh, to safety. Um, these are critical times when whistleblowers are under attack, when journalists who are supposed to be there to ensure the functioning of a democratic society are very much under siege. And I hope we're talking about that today. Yeah, let me ask you another question because you're an investigative journalist. <laughs> At Democracy Now!, do you think your phones are tapped? 
Matt, do you have any inside information on that? <laughs> To, to suggest I do is to say that the U.S. Department of Agriculture and the National uh, Park Service have a, a deep shared commitment, so um, that's not my lane. I would say no, but uh, it's not um, my lane. Well, I mean, just the fact that we have to ask this question is extremely serious. Uh, some of the leading reporters in our country, uh, James Risen of the New York Times, uh, is uh, currently... Um, could possibly face jail time under this administration. I'm sure he hoped there would have been change with a new Obama administration, but this is the administration under which he's being prosecuted. Um, and Glenn Greenwald, I was just at the ceremony right before the Pulitzer Prize, the George Polk Award, where Glenn Greenwald and Laura Poitras, the filmmaker who was together with Glenn in first revealing and interviewing uh, Edward Snowden in Hong Kong, flew back to the United States. That shouldn't have been a big deal. I mean, two j American journalists flying into the United States to get a top prize in journalism. But we were all at the Midtown New York Hotel waiting for them, concerned that they would be arrested on their way from the airport. They had not come into the country in 10 months since they had interviewed Edward Snowden, getting strong signals from the government, uh, Republican and Democrat, that they could be charged if they entered the United States. They weren't, and they've now traveled freely there. I think just to add to that, it's an interesting question. Are your phones tapped? Because a lot of the legislative measures that governments are pushing forward almost make that question, maybe not obsolete, but add to the depth of the risk that journalists and citizens are facing. So at Avaz, we've been campaigning strenuously on issues uh, like ACTA, uh, SOPA and PIPA in the United States, which are legislative measures that allow collection of big data and then the storage of it. Not only a huge risk because all our data sits somewhere that's like a big juicy prize for hackers, but also a huge risk because it's the collection of data without any sort of warrant process or rule of law. You know, you think about one of the huge controversies during the Bush administration years, and it was uh, Vice President Dick Cheney um, developing an energy policy where he met with who knows how many energy companies. And um, people felt it was important he reveal who he met with at the White House. I'm not even saying what he talked about just who he met with. That's the metadata when you call someone just knowing who you called. That involved lawsuits, and in the end, we did not find that information out. Glenn Greenwald just spoke at Carnegie Hall, and he said that when Senator Feinstein um, uh, said, we're just looking, the government's just looking at metadata, not what you say, but simply who you're talking to, um, he made up an email address, and he said, listen, I'm not asking to find out what you talk about all day, but at the end of every day, Senator, if you could just send me everyone you met with that day, I'll give you my email address. He said, that email address has never been written to. But think about what that means when an, a government says, we're not actually listening to everything you say, though that is seriously in question today because it may well be that the content is being listened to but we're just finding out who it is you're talking to. To get that kind of profile, where you are every day, who you talk to, is I think when you think about yourself and what you want to be known, a very serious threat to what we as citizens of whatever country um, uh, feel a government, uh, a very powerful force should know about our private lives. You asked her whether Amy's phone is tapped, um, but uh, she disrupted us. It's, a, it's an iPhone, which means she cannot take the battery out, which means that she, she, her movements can be tracked. So if mm. she is trying to meet with a confidential source, and there's suspicion as to who this confidential source is, and the confidential source also has an iPhone, it's very easy to see when they're meeting. Mm. Well, you could just keep my phone. <laughs> Professor Guy Berger, are editors doing enough to secure newsrooms and to, you know, safeguard investigative journalism? Uh, absolutely not. And in fact, uh, Glenn Greenwald mentioned digital security training, which is absolutely key. But that's not the only thing. Because it's a bit like uh, one could use a health metaphor. You know, everyone to practice good personal hygiene should 
wash their hands well before they eat. But if the kitchen is contaminated, it's not going to help you. And if the health inspectors aren't doing their job, it's also not going to help the kitchen to be decontaminated. So you know, editors need to also work on a much broader front here uh, to tackle all the different levels. And uh, I'd like to tell you something else. Uh, last year at UNESCO, the member states there, 195 governments, they said privacy is essential to protect journalistic sources which enable a society to benefit from investigative journalism. Such privacy should not be subject to arbitrary or unlawful interference. So the question to editors is, do you know about the statement? Have you considered going to speak to your authorities to say, by the way, your representatives in Paris have signed up to this fine statement, and what does it mean in practice? What are we going to do? Because in this digital age, the confidentiality of sources is likely no longer to be the same as the secrecy of sources. So what are the institutional arrangements to provide protection for sources in the digital age? Matthew Armstrong, do you think <coughs> it has become easier or more difficult for whistleblowers or for people to blow the whistle due to new media? Well, I'm, I'm going to sh shift the conversation from the United States to the places where we focus on, mm -hmm. which is uh, uh, largely what's represented in this uh, the forum. Um, it has made it much easier because the countries where we operate, it's not just is your phone tapped and are you going to be tracked for who you spoke with. It's you're going to be killed. It's your family is going to be jailed. They're going to be killed. It is a threat. It is a threat for the very existence of journalism in many of these countries. And the means of engagement goes through uh, a variety of mediums, uh, different internet platforms, to radio, whether it's uh, uh, FM, AM, shortwave, to satellite. We do uh, the proxy services, the um, uh, anonymity uh, systems to protect for the privacy. So um, yes, it does make it easier, but it's a two-edged sword. It makes it easier for people to receive information. It, it empowers people through the freedom to listen, which we often forget about. We talk about uh, uh, internet freedom, but the real essence of internet freedom is the freedom to listen and the freedom to speak, which is tied to the freedom of expression. And that's what uh, 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 people fear, and that's where the, we are and where we operate, so that there can be an idea of what a political process could look like, what transparency c can look like, how, what journalists are supposed to do. We do a lot of journalist training so that the journalists can get out there and report and they can be uh, uh, secure and citizen journalists because, of course, in these markets, in these areas, the concept of journalism is uh, difficult. And these journalists can be targeted for a variety of means. Just by being in a place, whether a journalist or not, they're going to be shot, they're going to be jailed. So, yes, uh, 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 online media uh, does create additional abilities to track, to see, both sides of the conversation. The reason I'm concerned about the mo role model that the U.S. presents in challenges to privacy and protection of people's not only civil liberties, but their very lives, is not only because I'm an American journalist, is because the United States is the most powerful country on earth. And, you know, when the Al Jazeera reporters uh, were sentenced, um, I thought about our own country and the model presented, for example, um, by the U.S. government jailing Sami al Haj, the Al Jazeera reporter at Guantanamo, for over six years, continually interrogated and questioned about the leaders of Al Jazeera, strangely enough. I could only think about if, you know, a CBS reporter was held for years and questioned about the owners of CBS and what their views were. Um, but that's why it's so important um, that we hold our governments accountable, why transparency is absolutely critical, but also the overall coverage um, that, for example, the U.S. media, not just the U.S. government, but the U.S. media um, gives to, for example, war. Take the Iraq war. I mean, right now we're at a very difficult time. Iraq is in a mass crisis, a catastrophic situation right now. But let's go back 10 years to 2003. There's a media watch group called FAIR, Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, FAIR.org, that's based in New York. 
that did a very interesting study of the four major nightly newscasts, the two weeks around um, Secretary of State Colin Powell giving his speech at the UN February 5th, 2003. It was about six weeks before the invasion of Iraq, a very critical time. As you saw in that introductory video, Professor Noam Chomsky. Uh, Noam Chomsky talks about the manufacturing of consent, the manufacturing of consent for war. So Fair looked at the four nightly newscasts in the U.S., NBC Nightly News, CBS Evening News, ABC World News, and the PBS, the Public Broadcasting News Hour. In the two weeks around Powell giving his, what essentially became a push for war at the UN, very sad speech where he uh, said the evidence for weapons of mass destruction was in. Um, he himself calls it a stain on his career. Um, there were 393 interviews done around war on these four major nightly newscasts. Only three were with peace leaders, anti-war leaders, three of almost 400, at a time when the population was divided, evenly divided over whether to go to war or not. Three of almost 400? That is no longer a mainstream media. That's an extreme media beating the drums for war. And that has to be challenged. I really do think that the media can be the greatest force for peace on earth. Instead, it is all too often wielded as a weapon of war. Now, of course, on the web, a lot of different interest groups and also radical groups are competing for attention because you just mentioned Iraq. I mean, in Iraq, we have ISIS, a radical Islamist group who has hundreds of millions of dollars, who is highly professional, who is using the web. How do you deal with that, Matthew Armstrong? Well, you deal with it by getting, well, first you have to understand who's their audience and who they're engaging and who, and you have to figure out what can you do. Um, Boko Haram, let me, let me change it slightly and look at Boko Haram. We're spinning up against, we, not th this agent, well, we are a as well, but w in the popular, in the media, there's discussion about Boko Haram and there's how do we respond to their message. Well, Boko Haram doesn't care what you think. You're not the audience. And so we have to look at who is their audience and how do you engage them because they're, they're causing terrible havoc in Nigeria and, and, and the region. Um, ISS, ISI, ISIS and ISIL, um, the same idea. You have to look at who the audience is. They, um, they, they uh, uh, promote what's best called terror porn. They just are absolutely horrendous. And the U.S. media, and I focus abroad, but the U.S. media, and I, and I think your, your criticism is, is, is far ranging and it needs to be focused on probably the profit model of the media. But the U.S. media has essentially buried its head in the sand with regard to the realities of ISIS and how terrible they actually are. Um, and in the reality that they don't actually represent Islam because of the extreme measures. And even though they just declared a caliphate, uh, they don't have clear, it's clear they have no interest in actually governing. They're just going to slaughter and the people are probably going to turn around. So how do you empower those people? Well, uh, uh, you provide them access to news and information, which is, um, uh, 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 whether it's radio-like activities or journalism training or how do you run a media operation in Afghanistan or uh, our open technology fund, opentechfund.org, uh, open where you can go get privacy tools, or it's just radio. In uh, Democratic Republic Congo, we do radio to try to help the, the refugees to understand what's going on. So um, information is part, is only part of the solution. Um, but you need to help the people to understand what is the reality, that there is another alternative, a different uh, uh, alternative, and there's means of connecting so that they know, and this is what new media or online media does that radio didn't. Radio, I heard something, but I wasn't able to engage somebody. On the Internet, I can now engage somebody. I can find out through the privacy tools and all this. I can find out, oh, hey, I, I, I have other people that think like me, and then you can start to band together. We saw this... Uh, um, really with the, uh, the anti-FARC movement was one of the really big social movements that we saw. But uh, um, there are a variety of tools, but it's not just information. There have to be other activities. Yeah, and in the 
United States, the media should open up to voices other than those who waged the war in 2003. Right now, with the crisis in Iraq, um, the most frequent voices on the U.S. networks are Dick Cheney um, uh, and the Bush administration officials who initially waged that war, the very people who got it wrong. And as I listened to this media forum yesterday, I was um, thinking about when we talk about new media, why it has been successful, the issue of has new media now challenged the old media newspapers. I don't think it's so much new media or old media. I think it is the fact that at least in the United States, and I'm curious about in many other countries, um, who controls the airwaves? Who gets to be heard? People lost faith starting in 2003. When the lies of weapons of mass destruction were exposed, people turned elsewhere. It wasn't just that the internet, you know, a sort of non-political issue, the technology changed. It was that people finally had access to information other than what the corporate media gatekeepers were allowing out. That's why um, there has been so much, I think, horizontal communicating around the world. People were looking for other truths. We're looking for the truth. It's interesting, just to pick up on where both of you left off, you talked about the media that ISIS is using to recruit, and I'm sure all of us have seen those videos. It's the same medium that the, the original democracy protesters in Syria were using to get out information about the atrocities that Assad was committing on the ground. That's the democracy of the internet, really, and the democracy of web media. Um, and then we turn to what you're talking about with the war in Iraq, and that's about the consolidation of ownership in the mainstream media. And it's always talked about that the internet is going to somehow crack that consolidation of media. And I think there was a great moment of hope. Um, at, we saw a, a wonderful proliferation of citizen journalism around the democracy movements in the Middle East. And now we look at the net neutrality legislation that's coming down, which sounds a bit wonky, net neutrality. Um, it's a big issue right now in the US. And that's essentially creating superhighways of information that connect these consolidated media conglomerates with audience and make it much harder, yes, to get access to the ISIS video but also to get access to the democracy movements. And if you want to stop people from engaging with ISIS online, you've got to get to the root problem. You can't start controlling those mediums of information. And that's why net neutrality is such an important issue globally. It's why we have to fight for that democratic and free and open internet. It's our best tool to undermine that consolidation of ownership that we see in the United States and that all of us see in our countries. And then, Seth, and that's an excellent point. So, on, on that, the, a tremendous threat is internet sovereignty, where countries like Russia, who Snowden is a false idol, and Russia and, and Russia is, is shutting down the conversation. Their internet censorship is coming. The alternative voices are are, are going away. Um, they're already mostly uh, disappeared, but um, internet sovereignty is what countries like China and Russia are seeking, so that they can isolate their information environments, and they can control what their people get access to. And this is part of what we're fighting for. And I'm not, this is not me suggesting that the current model is right. I'm making no statement on what the current model is. I'm saying the internet sovereignty model that China and Russia are encouraging is not the right, right solution. Um, you're absolutely right. You can't censor the internet. In fact, what we have seen is when regimes shut down mobile and internet connectivity, whether it was Iran, whether it's Syria, or, or pick any country, and there have been uh, uh, well over a dozen, unfortunately, situations, they turn them back on very quietly. Now, the news reports on the shutdown. They never report on turning it back on because of the collateral damage that it causes the regime. So it is an important medium, even the mobile and, and the internet, but and, and they can't do away with them. So they go away with a lot of uh, a celebration, but they come back on because they simply can't do do away with it. We see this in China, in Syria, all these different countries, Iran as, as well. It's an important medium, but it's not the only one. And to your point, it's about information. It's information. How do you get the information moving around? Is it paper? Yeah, in some places it is. We heard, we saw a story yesterday, one of the Bob Awards was the paper. 
That's the medium for that audience. That's how you engage. And others, it's Twitter. For others, it's uh, 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 pick a medium. And um, this is what we need to focus on. It's the information, and that's power. Right. I think it goes back to shaping public opinion. I mean, you mentioned Dick Cheney's on TV every single day uh, defending his legacy and uh, shaping uh, the framing for uh, this current conflict in Iraq. And so um, I think it always depends on, you know, are you using the Internet as a government or as an outside group trying to put an issue uh, on the table uh, effectively? If we look back in Germany, and of course, uh, we started out the conversation about privacy and the uh, NSA revelations, uh, you know, the chancellor in the press conference with President Obama said uh, that the Internet is somewhat unchartered territory. This is Neuland, which was uh, the big term in, in Germany. And it was like the chancellor is now discovering the Internet. That was sort of the joke. Uh, this, of course, is 2013. And um, Germany, of course, is very, very interested in privacy, very critical of it. And uh, it took off in the media. We've been talking about this for uh, a year now. And so still, it's interesting to me that with this important topic and which concerns so many people, which is such an important aspect of our culture, uh, still voter turnout didn't pick up in the 2013 uh, federal elections over here. It seems like so many people signed petitions, so many people were super excited about it. It was on every front page every day. And so we're talking about participation uh, in this global media forum. And still people didn't go out and vote and people didn't actually take those chance, uh, the, uh, the necessary steps to actually change something. So uh, I feel like public opinion making is part of it, uh, but it's also about engagement and actually changing something. Um, just to answer that, one of the theories behind voter turnout is that people are losing a sense of investment and, uh, and a loss of examples of effectiveness in the traditional democratic system, and they're coming up with new channels to express their opinions and have democratic effect. So there are people who can take action through an avows campaign, for example, and seek concrete governmental change and they vote in an election between two choices, neither of which represent their interests, and they see less effectiveness. So the march of democracy is happening worldwide, but those channels of democratic expression of global public opinion, those are kind of a new unexplored power. We like to at Avaz call it the new global superpower. Um, and it might end up meaning that people are expressing themselves more in that way than they are in the traditional you know, voting capacity. Not that we shouldn't all vote. But we have to recognize to meet people where they are and what they're seeing effective, you know, be effective and what they're seeing essentially undermine their rights and undermine their, their interests. If I just real, real quick, in that we need to be cautious, I fully agree with everything you said, but we need to be cautious about mirror imaging because other people don't have the same experience, knowledge, history with political processes, rule of law, human security commerce, all that. So we have to be careful of what we think because we see on the internet or we, we have a conversation with somebody that the society, the people we're trying to empower have the same baseline understanding or that they have the same trajectory. So it's, we, it's too easy to mirror image, especially with online activism. We, there, there needs to be a specificity for that audience. <laughs> well, sorry, I just wanted to put in, uh, perhaps to problematize a little bit what I think some colleagues might be uh, heading towards. On this question of extremism on social media, certainly the best antidote is much more pluralism of information, and I think the, that point's been well made. But I think one has to wrestle with the case. Is there, is there a rationale for surveillance of this kind of stuff on, on the Internet? And if so, then you are in the issue of jurisdiction issues. <laughs> And who is then involved in monitoring uh, ISIS on social media or, or Boko Haram on social media? Uh, what are the mutual legal assistance treaties they have with the, with the government uh, or the authorities in that terrain? These are, these are quite tricky questions. And so I, I think that we understand the principles, but now putting them into practice uh, is the difficult thing. I would say, though, that in doing so, we could really learn from what Frank LaRue, who's the UN Special Rapporteur on Freedom of Expression, he did a report even before the Snowden disclosures about surveillance. And he said that, first of all, human rights must be at the heart of surveillance. Second, he said, surveillance must be exceptional. Like all human rights, the norm is non-surveillance. It's exceptional to surveil. That, that's what he said. It must be independently monitored with judicial authorities, uh, the nature, the scope, the duration, the author competent authorities and the remedies have to be elaborated. So these are really important questions. And then when you come to the jurisdiction question, we're still babies in the world in terms of working out these jurisdictional relationships about legitimate surveillance. Um, 
Also this week, there are some very interesting developments taking place here in Germany, right? That Germany has opened up an inquiry around the revelations um, from the documents that Edward Snowden released. Among the people who are speaking this week is William Binney, um, who is a top-level um, official in the National Security Agency for decades uh, until he quit over his deep concern over the fact that the NSA was involved, not why he joined in trying to protect national security, but in this kind of mass surveillance. Um, we were the first to interview him on Democracy Now!, and I urge people to check it out at democracynow.org. We had uh, him on a year or two ago, along with Laura Poitras, the filmmaker, and Jake Applebaum, who now lives in Berlin. Uh, these are all internet freedom activists. And Bill Binney, what he faced after he quit, deeply concerned that the American people, like Edward Snowden, he was deeply concerned that the American people did not know what was going on in their name. I mean, he was at home in the shower. Um, this is a former top NSA official. And the federal authorities moved in, a SWAT team moved in. He is a diabetic amputee. He, they had a gun to his head in the shower. Uh, his kid and his wife were uh, forced off into another room, and they raided his home at the time that they raided other NSA employees' homes who were raising the same concerns. Thomas Drake will also be testifying, who was actually prosecuted by the U.S. government, who worked for the NSA. But this is all happening in Germany this week, which is fascinating at a time when uh, the government has canceled a contract with one of the biggest U.S. telecommunications companies, Verizon, because of its involvement in spying on Germans. And of course, you know about the scandal around the, the U.S. government spying on your own chancellor's cell phone, not to mention average everyday German citizens. But there is a very serious opportunity this week um, for Germany to open up a discussion that we might not even be having in the United States, and also a very serious discussion about whether Edward Snowden should be granted political asylum here. Um, these are issues now that we must discuss on a global scale. We don't even have borders, and that's the beauty of an international global media that it crosses borders and that we around the world can have these conversations together. Thank you so much. Let me quickly go to the Twitter team so I understand their comments and questions. Yes, of course. Um, the discussion has been heating up on Twitter as well. A lot of uh, statements uh, from Amy Goodman, um, including this one media uh, from Samia Poverda, who re retweeted what he said, saying media can be the greatest weapon for peace in the world, but usually is used to manufacture consent for war. Um, but then there's also some uh, criticism of this panel. Um, there's some people who feel that it represents only one side of the political, you know, the political views, the left and not the right. So uh, says Nitin Pai here um, on Twitter. So this panel at the DW JMF plenary supports Snowden, not even a token contrary view. Diversity of opinion, anyone? Um, there's also someone else, uh, Juan Nagel, who says, panel on online activism features no speakers from the center-right variety would have been illuminating. So perhaps, um, I don't know if that's something that could be commented on uh, by the panel. I see I'm So um, I'm gonna take it, well, my party politics. I'm, I'm apolitical in my operations, and I'm apolitical on the board. I take, I take offense um, that uh, uh, this is all left-leaning. My focus is um, is the people, is empowering the people. I'm not left. I'm not right. And I'm also trying to, as you heard from the conversation, I'm trying to shift this to the audience, the countries that this audience represents. And what I'm, what I uh, think is the audience that we're hearing on Twitter too is what are the challenges that are being faced in political opinion formation by those audiences, by those people that are living under uh, uh, deeply oppressed and repressive regimes that don't have free access to news information, that have uh, um, uh, uh, resource scarcity, freedom scarcity, and threats. Um, so I would like to think, yes, let's move this, that I am trying to, to move it in that, and um, uh, um, 
I, I suppose for the record, I'm a Republican, um, but my, my work is apolitical. Uh, you'll be hard pressed to find politics in my work. So. And also, this is not a left-right divide. This is a corporate people divide. That, let's just be clear. This is not a partisan or bipartisan or non you know. And, uh, and as long as we keep that in mind, what we're talking about here is who wants to control information, who wants to make money off of delivering information, who wants to make money off of controlling what it is we decide to believe as a society, and who wants to democratize information, who wants to get people and participation out there. That's the question we're dealing with as a panel. Um, and I think we have a diversity of views all of which are recognizing one central issue, which is that the right of people to speak freely and to deliver information freely is fundamental. That's not controversial. The United Nations is on board with that. Uh, the governments that are not on board with that are actively trying to suppress speech and in many of them actively pursuing their own people violently. So let me give you the chance to ask questions now in person, not only by Twitter. Okay, there's a question. Sorry, your microphone is coming in a second. Good morning for all. I am Mahmoud Shakir from Iraq and Baghdad. Uh, I listened to your speech. There is a misunderstanding that Iraq now very, very dangerous, and this is not true. Unfortunately, some media didn't convey the truth in Iraq. I took uh, a lot of media in this Saturday, last Saturday, to take uh, a tour with the military convoy around Baghdad, south of Baghdad especially which is uh, very close to the uh, international Baghdad airport. And you, you see that I am come to Bonn to participate here uh, by uh, use the uh, international airport. And the news, some news from some media, unfortunately, they say that Daesh is control Baghdad international uh, airport. So uh, I address my speech to U.S. and uh, some uh, some Europe to help Iraq just to uh, send weapons, we, uh, modern weapons. And in this case, Iraq can control about everything. Thank you very much for Just respond real, real quickly. Um, and I'm not going to speak directly to Iraq, but w w we have people in northern Iraq, and it's not a safe environment, and there are issues with our transmitters in northern Iraq, but I'm not going to speak to the larger Iraq issue. What I would like to speak to is that we have reporters where we operate almost across the board is by definition dangerous places where commercial media don't go or they parachute in and leap out. So we operate in those very scary places and we have a persistent presence there so that we can report it. And one of my wishes is that we actually affect U.S. domestic media because our content is freely available by anyone who wants to do it, blog or commercial media, whatever they want, um, so that they can get the on-the-ground reporting from Yerevan from Kiev, from uh, uh, Somalia, from where D DRC, wherever it is. And then that would not get government media onto the airwaves, but that would press the, commer press the commercial U.S. media to reestablish their presence abroad because they retreated from abroad. And this goes into some of the, the reporting, the sensationalism that, that, that we see. I have to say I'm very concerned. I mean, after World War II, the smith munt Act was passed in the United States that said that the U.S. cannot propagandize its own people. And that's why Voice of America, and well, let me just make, just sort of to make a point. Um, that's why it was not allowed to be heard in the United States. Um, it could be heard in other countries. It was called public diplomacy but not allowed to propagandize its own people. You all know the dangers of propaganda as we are here in Germany, and it was a response to that. Um, uh, having said that, I think it's really important to ask in the United States, though we don't have state media, if we did, how would it be any different than what we have today? when you see the a very narrow um, array of voices that get on the media in the United States. So with regard to, and I'll try to be brief, um, I'm actually writing a book on the Smith-Munn Act, 
the narrative that the smith munn Act in 1945, and it was first introduced in early 45, I mean, it was passed in 1948, January, the myth that it was to censor the U.S. government is utterly and completely false, and I can show you the congressional statements, the, the uh, 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 executive session meetings, the public statements by the State Department, by the Congress. In fact, the line in the legislation that says, shall disseminate abroad, was an explicit authority requested by the State Department because at the end of the war, the expiration of war powers, the State Department was going to revert to its 39, 1939 legislation that it was only going to be permitted to operate in the Western Hemisphere as far as the information and cultural and educational and technical exchanges were concerned. And the Senate said, Senate Foreign Relations Committee questioned them on that line. And the State Department said, we need the explicit authority to go abroad. Because as a matter of fact, at the time, the U.S. people, the U.S. Congress, were banging on the State Department to be more open about their activities. So the, the notion that this was about censoring the government is utterly and completely false. The narrative comes from, ironically, Senator Fulbright, who in 1972 attempted to abolish USIA, abolish the radios, the Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, made a telling statement in 1972 that the radios, which was shorthand for Radio Free, uh, Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, should be given the opportunity to take the rightful place in the graveyard of Cold War relics. In 1967, the, this was 72 that he said that. In 1967, the U.S. Advisory Commission on Information, headed by Frank Stanton, who was at the time the head of CBS, said the American taxpayer deserves to know what is being said and done in their name, and this content should be freely available, especially under what was then called the Moss Act, which we now, know, now, we now know as the Freedom of Information Act. 1985, Zen Zerinsky caused change in the legislation that the federal court ruled that USIA material was exempt from Freedom of Information Act under an, a, a special exemption. At the same time, the U.S. Congress said, and this was unrelated, that foreign government propaganda no longer needs to have that label. It no longer needs that. This had to do with Canada wanting to do a pro, uh, uh, videos on acid rain and, and, and nuclear. I think we'll read the book. Well, okay, but let, let me, uh, thank you. I'll, I'll shut up about it, but the, the notion that Smithmont was actually about until, uh, before 1972, was about censoring the U.S. government is utterly and completely false. It is a, it, it's, a per, uh, uh, it's a false narrative. America and the United States. You actually could. You could. They weren't supposed. No, they were no, not no. supposed to propagandize no. their own people. That's a different thing. Senator Zerinsky, when he said that in '85, was actually comparing USIA to a Soviet domestic propaganda agency because he was upset at the USIA director for spending fifty thousand dollars on on USIA agency funds on a home security system, and nepotism within USIA. So there's a context there for his statement, and that is never quoted in full. Mr. Armstrong, I'm sorry, I'm sure you're feeling a bit pummeled. Um, I get the point that you were making that it's important to look at other countries where there are very grave issues with press freedoms and any work that actually helps those situations is of course commendable. But I do have an issue with you saying that, it, that that should be the only focus. I think it's extraordinarily important the examples that are set by countries like the United States, the UK, when they go around telling other people how to do it. If, for example, there was a whistleblower in Iraq, an Iraqi whistleblower, that they put in a cage, tortured, and then sentenced to 35 years in prison, you would probably have an issue with it, I think. But that's exactly what the US government did to Chelsea Manning. And I'm not exaggerating by saying it's torture. Frank LaRue, when he was spe special rapporteur on torture, said, made this statement himself. There is a secret grand jury against a publishing organization in the United States. The very proxies and tools that you speak about giving to other countries to help their press freedoms, you're attacking within your own country for your own people using them. And so I guess my question is, do you really not think it's important to lead by example? I, first, I welcome the question. I, I, I welcome the question and um, uh, I can continue the, the conversation afterwards. Yes, I do believe it's, it's important. Um, my remit, my job, my role is abroad. So that's naturally where you're going to see me talk. Um, with regard to my agency and reporting on these issues, we do. We reported on Abu Ghraib. 
We report. I don't personally know the coverage of of, uh, of Manning and, and the situation. Um, uh, that's simply a fact. I, I simply don't know what we did. But for example, Abu Ghraib, I know we covered that extensively. We do things where our ambassadors uh, call us up and say, please stop. And we say, no, this is about the openness, the transparency, the fact that we can have this conversation. Go ahead. So you reported on, you spoke about the torture that your own U.S. soldiers were doing to Iraqis. Yes, we did, because it was news. And it made people uncomfortable. And this is part of um, the independent media that we try to instill. Um, we have different entities, Radio Free Europe and Radio Free Asia, Office Cuba Right, for example, focus on local countries and the news within there, but they also pull news out. Voice of America tends to gen uh, focus on global news, regional events, and U.S. events. Um, but we do report on those things. It makes the government uh, uncomfortable, our government uncomfortable. In fact, a key reason why my job exists is to be a firewall between our journalists and the political establishment. If you suggested to me that I should go, that our people should go cover a story, I would tell you I cannot do that. At best, I could go to the director of one of these entities, Radio Free Europe, or Voice of America, and ask, are we, should we, what, uh, and I have to be very careful about my wording, otherwise they throw up a firewall violation and I get reported to the IG, the Inspector General. So this is where we foster an independent media for what we do. I agree, lead by example. I'm not personally speaking on it, and you're softly, you're politely challenging me on it, but it, it's not my job. My job is these audiences, that's why you hear me. Um, we do, do use these privacy tools. And just to, to put it out there, you picked up on a very interesting dichotomy, which is we promote privacy, security in conversations. Where does that fit? Well, as I said at the beginning, when, when Amy asked me what's my opinion on, on whatever was the NSA stuff, or whether her phone was tapped, um, we are a part of the foreign policy establishment, not the domestic policy establishment. So it, it's like comparing U.S. Department of Agriculture to, I don't know, Department of Commerce, or actually that's a little too close, but forest, forestry, right? Different jobs. So I hope that answers, and I'm happy to continue the conversation offline if you wish. Mm -hmm. Okay, there's a question here. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Joe Kalua uh, from Guta University, Frankfurt. Um, I've got one question and a half. Uh, what do you think, who do you think is more at risk? The, the media that is being persecuted and their phones being tapped or the masses that look up to the media and their phones are being tapped by the government and the media? The last half question, why should the people trust the media for information if it is also tapping their, their phones. Thank you. Could I answer this? Uh, well, the case of media targeting people's phones, I, I don't think is the general journalistic ethic. It's, it's a huge violation of human rights uh, and a crime. And uh, I think we've just seen in the UK uh, the process of justice dealing with those journalists. But the bigger question is, which is more important, I, I suppose? Is it the journalists being uh, tapped or the public being tapped? And journalists are not uh, super special. I, I, apolo I apologize to everybody in the audience here. <laughs> but journalists are visible. And if the public see a journalist attacked with impunity, or the public see that a journalist is being bugged, what conclusion do they draw themselves? Because it's, it's right there in front of everybody. And if a, if a woman journalist is threatened, what does it say to women in the home about asserting their rights to freedom of expression? So I really think we need to look at those who do journalism and we need to find ways to protect them precisely because if you don't protect them, their sources, which is one way the public helps uh, partially communicates to the, to the rest of the public, their sources will be frozen. The sources will be too scared to, to approach journalists. In this connection, I, I want to signal one important thing. The 2nd of November this year is the start of a new day on the international calendar. This was agreed last year in the General Assembly. It's the International Day to End Impunity for Crimes Against Journalists. 2nd of November. Many of you know about the 3rd of May, which is uh, World Press Freedom Day. Please, the 2nd of November, it's a day not to make journalists super special, but to say journalists are symbols of freedom of expression for everybody, and they should be protected, and those who attack them should not have impunity for those attacks. I think 
it's, it's also important to, to figure out who a journalist is. In many countries like China, the journalist that we're interested in is not the professional journalist. We're empowering the, the, the people. Um, in a place like Thailand, the Committee for uh, Protection of Journalists, I think it was, ranked, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I said Thailand, I think, Vietnam is the third worst place of jailing journalists. But in the definition, we include bloggers. Um, it's open season on bloggers in Vietnam. So it, it depends on where you're talking. It is about the people. Because in, in, in so many of the places, again, where we operate, there is not a free media. And so you're talking about the individuals and you need to protect them and empower them and understand and help them understand what they need to do. It's an excellent question. And of course, people at the grassroots, the masses of people are much more endangered than journalists. Journalists are very much a bellwether of freedom in a society. But when the freedom of the press is attacked, what that really is an attack on is the public's right to know. And that's what's most important. That's what's essential to the functioning of a democratic society. Um, yes, please. Um, yesterday, uh, Secretary General uh, Yagland made a comparison to the long-term effects of the internet compared to the telephone. Uh, I would like to also propose another comparison, and that is to the historic effects of the cotton gin on giving a new lease on life to slavery in the US. An example of how a technological change can um, make a change in uh, economics and overall society. And I would point to the uh, example of um, uh, here, the example of the campaign of Obama, that um, as an American citizen, I would say we feel that we were tricked, that uh, the ratings of Obama today are lower than George W. Bush. And yet that campaign was carried out with this new technology. It used the technology to the exquisite level, and it raised the level to a new, a new level. People in America had a great deal of hope. We really trusted that um, our voices would be heard, and somehow this new media was able to funnel it all into this particular funnel and make it so that now we end up with exactly the way Amy mentioned, uh, a president who's had more whistleblowers locked up, never closed down Guantanamo, uh, continued all these wars, um, I feel that you know, this is an example of how this new technology was applied on a level to bring us to another level of tricking us. Um, so I'm not saying that I contradict what was said yesterday, but here's another example of how the internet can really limit uh, freedoms. Thank you. I think there's so many points to that, and one is, you know, for every time we feel like the internet has tricked us, and we just saw the study coming out for Facebook, uh, playing with that emotions, uh, doing some trick tests on it. You know, at the same time, so many people all of a sudden get a choice and get a voice in it. And one of the things we talked about, journalism, uh, we mentioned Rupert Murdoch in, in the UK. I remember the Voss campaigns that were run with that. Uh, that had a tremendous impact. Uh, we're going to be later talking about uh, uh, Bring Back Our Girls, where one person just, you know, creates a hashtag and starts uh, tweeting. And all of a sudden, somebody who hasn't been part of the, you know, classical media landscape all of a sudden gets to make make news and have everyone report on it uh, worldwide. So I feel like the notion that, you know, some people will be tricking you uh, doesn't level the playing field for everyone getting into it and be able to actually get their point across. I just want to make a, a wider point. Um, Obama didn't steal your hope. You still have it. He may not have made good on the promises on the campaign trail, and he may be a disappointment in many ways as a leader of the United States. But that moment where the American people tapped into that feeling of hope, and we see it worldwide, I see it at Avaz every day in our campaigns, that's incredibly powerful. And then it's about finding channels for that hope. And many exist throughout the United States. They exist worldwide. Um, the internet doesn't trick us. People can trick us. But the internet also gives us a voice. Now we have time for one last question. Voilà. Merci pour la parole. Uh, ma question, uh, c'est par rapport à so Monsieur Matthew is, uh, Armstrong. Uh, pour la majorité d'entre nous, les États-Unis, uh, the United States. Sorry, the can you speak English or can uh, someone my, translate my for us? My English is very, very. Uh, voilà. Yeah, is there someone voilà. who can translate for us? Is there no one who speaks French and English? <laughs> <laughs> voilà. Yeah, uh, okay. Voilà. Please. 
And we have to make a brief voilà. voilà. Ma, ma question est pour M. Euh, Matthew Armstrong, so parce que pour la majorité d'entre nous, Armstrong, les États-Unis, um, qui est une grande United puissance, States, a une culture a démocratique. Nation, have a demo oui, lorsque a vous prenez les exemples de la Chine ou de la Russie, China, par rapport à l'Internet, uh, c'est comme si vous défilez un peu. Um, it is, uh, It is like some, somewhat not, not answering to the question. The question is for Mr. Armstrong, and he, he, remain, he is saying that for, uh, for many people in this world, the United Nations uh, represent an example of democratic, a democratic example. And is basically saying that when you refer to China or other countries like Russia, you're just avoiding the questions. So that's what he said. Um, yeah. Um, I appreciate the, the question, and uh, I apologize my four years of French. Um, um, yes, I will agree it to some degree, as I, as I said before, to some degree, I am avoiding the question about the United States because it's not my job, it's not my interest. My interest, as a citizen, it's my interest, but the pur purpose for my being here, my job, um, is to speak to the audiences abroad, outside the United States. Um, so I will take your criticism. Um, I am trying to steer the conversation to what I think are actually audiences uh, under greater threat and greater need. Um, I understand um, uh, uh, the, the situation. For the record, I think Jon Stewart is a terrific news program. Um, hinting at some what I suggest and the challenges with domestic media. But um, I focus on the outside world, outside of the United States. And I think some of those places are, it, it's worse. Overall, we need a media that covers power, not covers for power. We need a media that is the fourth estate, not for the state. And we need a media that covers the movements that create static and make history all over the world. And with these words, we have to end the panel. I want to say thank you to all the great panelists and the very controversial discussion. Thank you so much. And just shortly, the German Foreign Minister, Frank-Martin Steinmeier, will speak here. Thank you so much.